Welcome to the Information Security Forum podcast. I'm your host, Tavia Gilbert, and this podcast is the first of two episodes featuring ISF Managing Director Steve Durbin in conversation with journalist Mike Eckel. We're seeing the power, the influence, the ability of Russian uh, cyber actors to do such incredible work for good or for bad. Mike Eckel is senior Washington correspondent for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and a former Moscow correspondent for the Associated Press. Mike brings personal insight to his coverage of Russia after having lived in Russia during the late 90s as a university student and again between 2004 and 2010. In this, the first of two episodes, we'll be talking to Mike about the origins of Russian cyber terrorism and disinformation campaigns and the end game for Russian-sponsored threat actors. So what were the, some of the sort of origins, if you like, of, of some of this Russian cyber misinformation, disinformation, cyber terrorism, eventually? You know, it's hard to put your finger on exactly when there was this realization in Russia uh, that this was a tool that could be harnessed, you know, by the government, by security agencies, I mean, certainly the private sector, such as it is in Russia, was much uh, more aware of the tools that were available and the potential for both good and bad, you know, going back 18, 20, 25 years. And that's a function of the fact that Russia has, you know, just a world-class technical educational system where they produce physicists and oceanologists and astronomers and mathematicians who are without peer in the world and their ability to do theoretical research. So the system, and that's a legacy of the Soviet system. So uh, you had this system that, yes, it, it eroded somewhat after the Soviet collapse, and you had this great fear uh, or this, this phenomenon of the brain drain where, you know, a generation or more of Russia's best and brightest fled to the United States or to Israel for better opportunities uh, they were either lured away by governments or they were lured away by the private sector. But still, the system, the institutional memory of this technical system remained, and that's what we're seeing, you know, the power, the influence, the ability of Russian uh, cyber actors to do such incredible work for good or for bad. That's what we're seeing So uh, that's a long answer to your question. So certainly going back two decades, but, you know, in terms of internally versus externally, you have to sort of look at where when the internet really began to penetrate in Russia. And and of course, Russia was, you know, a few years behind the rest of the world in terms of the embrace of things like email and and e-commerce and, you know, peer-to-peer networks. But once they were able to embrace it, they, they did with a vengeance. So in terms of like, I mean, you use the terms like cyber terrorism, I think. Mm. One of the things that's that I think is important to know about Russia more broadly is this gray zone between public and private, this gray zone between government and criminal, this gray zone between who you're working for and who pays your bills. And, you know, this is a function of Russian society going back decades in that – you know, the relationship between the Russian government and the re- and relationship between Russian citizens or the Soviet government and the Soviet citizens, you know, there were bright lines that you don't cross. But there was always this gray area that people used in order to get by. Back in the Soviet day, it was to get groceries or get parts for your car or to get a new apartment. Um, and it was this not fully criminalized but still uh, allowed by the Soviet authorities – um, and that's how, you know, basically the average Soviet citizen survived. And so there's always been this this unspoken system of this gray zone that Russian society operates in. And, of course, that's interesting because, you know, the Soviet system was a, you know, it was a police state and the, the KGB was this all-pervasive, omniscient agency that could, you know, wiretap anyone's phones and pick you up at the drop of a hat and throw you in a prison in Siberia. Uh, But yet this gray zone was allowed to exist as a means for Soviet citizens to survive. You know, so fast forward to the late 90s, some years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and you still have this gray area where 
people uh, in the late 90s, they pushed the boundaries of law, they pushed the boundaries of norms because they had to in order to survive, but also because, I mean, in 1990, let's say 7, 98, the Russian state was still in, in free fall several years after the Soviet collapse. So if you were a person with great technical knowledge, if you had access to computer equipment, uh, maybe it's through your university, maybe it's through your technical school, you could tap into a world that was certainly unregulated within Russia and certainly wasn't being paid attention to by Russian law enforcement agencies like the FSB, the GRU, or the Interior Ministry, or any of the other agencies. So the Russian hacker, Russian cyber actors sort of came of age broadly speaking, in that lawless time, the Wild West of the 90s. And it was only later on that the Russian state, probably several years into Putin, Vladimir Putin's reign, that there was a, an acknowledgement or uh, a recognition that you know, these cyber actors could be used for state priorities or goals, be it theft or hacking or surveillance or espionage or whatever the case might be. And so that brings us today, and that's what we've seen is that, uh, you know, the Russian government, the Russian uh, security agencies have, for years now, uh, figured out ways to utilize private citizens, private actors to either coerce them into service with for the Russian state or um, entice them into service for the Russian state. The GRU, the Military uh, Intelligence Agency, for example, has uh, in the past couple of years undertaken this robust recruiting campaign to basically hire promising hackers, you know, 16-year-olds with a computer in their dad's living room. If they show any sort of promise about hacking or cyber commerce, you know, they're, that's who the GRU is targeting and setting up these schools, these training schools, universities where they're given, you know, Nice dorms, nice stipends, state-of-the-art computer equipment, and you're basically allowed to do whatever sort of hacking you want as long as it's done in the interest of, uh, in this case, the GRU. It should be noted that the Russians aren't the only ones that utilize private hackers in the service of, you know, state goals, state priorities. I mean, certainly the United States... Um, European governments have, have done the same since obviously the private sector is in many ways light years ahead of the public sector in terms of, you know, finding, pushing the boundaries of cyber operations and hacking and e-commerce and that sort of thing. But um, Russia's use of this technique has engendered the most concern, certainly in the United States. They, along with Iran, North Korea, and China are consistently deemed the most dangerous cyber threats in the world to the United States. And I think Robert Mueller's former chief of staff, who also worked, I believe, for the National Security Agency, had this really punchy op-ed in the New York Times over the summer where he talked about Putin had created a, a criminal cyber syndicate that was basically spreading its tentacles around the world. I'm not sure I would go that far in that characterization, but at the very least, it was a reflection of how U.S. law enforcement and U.S. security agencies view the abilities and the, and the dangers of, of Russian cyber uh, actors, both government and, and private. And, and what is the real sort of end game, Mike, for these you know Russian-sponsored threat actors? I mean, what is the strategy, if you like, that uh, the Russian government has for spreading this misinformation or disinformation or the sorts of things you've just been talking about? Well, I'm not sure there is – well, so there are two things here. Um, I think it's important to distinguish between like cyber operations that do things like implant malware or exfiltrate data, steal files like, for example, you know, the, the emails from the Democratic National Committee or conduct surveillance or have the potential to shut down, you know, critical infrastructure like the electrical grid or hydroelectric dams, for example, something we've seen talked about in recent months. So you have that, there's that basket. And then you also have the cyber influence operations, the swaying of public opinion and, and either through the media or through social media, which has obviously been in the news even more with Facebook and, and Twitter and the revelations that have shown up in some of the indictments by Robert Mueller uh, involving this entity in St. Petersburg, Russia, the Internet Research Agency, which is more commonly known as the Troll Factory. So, I mean, they're, they're two separate things, and they have two separate 
at least to my mind, they have two separate goals. Again, you know, if you're a, a GRU hacker, you know, with Unit 26165, which was the elite unit that was named in at least one of the Mueller indictments, they're looking to steal passwords and gain access to, uh, you know, again, the Democratic National Committee or the World Anti-Doping Agency or the Dutch laboratories that are investigating the downing of the Malaysian airliner over Ukraine in 2014. So, and then you have, again, the troll factor, the Internet Research Agency, which, as we know from not only the Mueller indictments, but other reporting that we've done and other and Russian reporters have done, talking about how to sway public opinion or merely to sow discord and, and chaos and distrust about, you know, in this case, the American democratic system. So what is the end game? I mean, that's a, that's a larger sort of non-cyber question. And I think that's a larger question about the Kremlin, about the way Vladimir Putin views both his standing in Russia, but also his standing vis-a-vis the West. And, you know, to that end, Putin clearly has great disdain for for anything Western in terms of governance, in terms of social norms, in terms of culture. Uh, There's admiration as well, uh, grudging admiration. But, you know, Putin's openly talked about, you know, anything like how gays and lesbians are treated in the West. That's just one small example. But in terms of the, the political system, you know, the way that the Western democracies operate, that type of system is a threat to the way that the Putin government has created over the past 18 years, um, 18 years that he's been in power. So anything that can be done in order to undermine faith in, you know, the basic democratic governments of how elections are conducted in the United States or how the Brexit referendum was conducted, you know, that goes to serve his purpose. It shows that these systems are corrupt or unstable or fragile or easily manipulated and and that the only tried and true method for governance in the 21st century is this authoritarian strongman model that the Kremlin has created behind Vladimir Putin. So again, I, that's the best way to look at it is not necessarily specifically through the cyber lens, but just what's the broader goal, or broader purposes to the Kremlin's thinking and how to use cyber operations to that end. That was the first of our two-part conversation with Mike Eckel, Radio Free Europe journalist. Be sure to listen for our second episode in this series of conversations with Mike, in which we address concerns about Russian meddling in election integrity, not just in the U.S., but worldwide the need for media literacy and good cyber hygiene, and the persistence of cyber attacks by global threat actors. You know, anything that goes to raise doubt in a person's mind about how the integrity of the electoral system, then you could say that is working towards the end of the Kremlin's goals. Until we're back with the second part of the conversation with Mike, we invite you to get in touch with us through our website or on Twitter at Security Forum. If there's someone you'd like us to interview or a topic you'd like to hear covered, let us know. And don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes. It really helps new listeners find us. In the meantime, for more resources for CISOs and anyone looking to enhance the security of their business, please visit securityforum.org.